constitutes what we call belief systems. Okay? And your freedom to believe whatever you want is a right and even a privilege in a free society. That's a good thing. Consider, however, that if you believe something that's part of a religious philosophy, and someone else has a different religion that's a different religious philosophy, and you're not agreeing with one another, and there's another religion over here, and another over here, and they don't agree, you're still free to believe what you want. But what that tells you is that it is unstable to build a government on a belief system. What you want is, what you want is objectively verifiable truths around which we can all agree. That's what you build your economic system on, your governance on. Once you have that, then you go forth to your mosques, to your churches, and to your Go forth and preach and believe whatever you want. But know the difference, as Galileo did, between how to go to heaven and how the heavens go. That's my answer to you. I'm going to appeal to you in a way that most people don't. I'm going to tell you things other people are not telling you. You get people who are space enthusiasts, let's go into space, it's our destiny, it's our next, great nations do it. And I look at history and I say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Here's what we got to do. We've known since the Industrial Revolution and earlier that innovation in science and technology, yes, it'll help defend a nation. But when you're not at war, you know what else innovation in science and technology does? It is the engine of tomorrow's economy. The engine. When Einstein wrote down his equation for the stimulated emission of radiation, which is the foundation of the laser, was he thinking to himself, Barcodes. <laughs> this is innovation in science, the applications of his ideas into machines, requires the clever engineer, creative investors and, and dynamic CEOs turn it into product. Don't ever tell me why are you studying this? How is it helping me? You know, I don't know how it's going to help you. I have no idea. Neither did Faraday. He just knew you would tax it. Neither did Einstein. Neither did anybody who made great discoveries about our understanding and our relationship to nature. Do I believe in UFOs? Or extraterrestrial visitors? I'm not authorized to answer that question. <laughs> um, where shall I begin? Um, UFO. First, remember what the U stands for in UFO. Now, there's a fascinating frailty of the human mind that psychologists know all about. And it's called argument from ignorance. And this is how it goes. You ready? Somebody sees lights flashing in the sky. They've never seen it before. They don't understand what it is. They say, a UFO. The U stands for unidentified. So they say, I don't know what it is, it must be aliens from outer space visiting from another planet. Well, if you don't know what it is, that's where your conversation should stop. You don't then say, it must be anything. Okay? That's what argument from ignorance is. It's common. I'm not blaming anybody. Psychologists know all about it. 
And it may relate to our burning need to have to know stuff because we're uncomfortable steeped in ignorance. You can't be a scientist if you're uncomfortable with ignorance because we live at the boundary between what is known and unknown in the universe. Unlike what journalists write, you ever see journalists? They, any journalists here? <laughs> you go to journalists. No. <laughs> you go to journalists. All articles about science discoveries begin. Scientists now have to go back to the drawing board. As though we're sitting up in our office, you know, <laughs> masters of the universe. It's like, oops, somebody discovered some. No, we're always at the drawing board. If you're not at the drawing board, you're not making discoveries. You're something else. So, the public, it appears, seems to have this burning need to have to have an answer to what is unknown. And so you go from an abject statement of ignorance to an abject statement of certainty. So, that is operating within us. Let's start there. Second, we know, not only from research in psychology, but simple empirical evidence in the history of science, that the lowest form of evidence that exists in this world is eyewitness testimony. <laughs> Which is scary because that's some of the highest form of evidence in the court of law. But we know from second grade, where's my guy from second grade? Okay, get up to the microphone for a minute. Look, grab the microphone, grab the microphone. In your classes, have you done the famous experiment where you play telephone? and you line up all your kids in class, and one person starts with a story, and then you hear it and you repeat it to the next person, and the next person, have you done that in class yet? Yes. You've done that experiment? Because what, hap what happens by the time you get to the last person, and they retell the story, what happens? It's like completely different. It's completely different! <laughs> completely different, okay? Because the conveyance of information was relying on eyewitness testimony, which in that case is ear witness testimony. And so, let's thank you. So, so we know that. So he knows it. He's in second grade. All right. So, actually, he should be in 12th grade, as we've established. <laughs> so, so now, so now, it wouldn't matter if you saw a flying saucer. In science, even if you have something less controversial than a flying saucer, if you come into my lab and you say, you gotta believe me, I saw it, and you're one of my fellow scientists, I say, I say go, go, back, go home. Go back until you have some other kind of evidence that's not just, you saw it, okay? Because human perception system is rife with all ways of getting it wrong, okay? But we don't like thinking of ourselves that way. We have high opinions of our human biology when, in fact, we should not. I'll give you an example of how it reveals itself. We've all bought and enjoyed books called, called um, uh, Optical Illusions, right? Well, we all love optical illusions, but that's not what they should call the book. They should call them brain failures, okay? Because that's what it is. It is a complete failure of human perception. All right? All it takes is a few sketches that are cleverly done. Your brain can't figure it out. All right? So, we are poor data-taking devices. That's why we have such a thing as science. Because we have machines that don't, don't care what side of the bed they woke up in the morning. Don't care what they said to their spouse that day. Doesn't care whether they had their morning caffeine. They'll get the data right. Okay? So, maybe you did see visitors from another part of the galaxy. I need more than your eyewitness testimony. And in modern times, I need more than your photograph, which Photoshop probably has a UFO button today. <laughs> like, stick it in, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> on your computer. So, here's, the, here's, the, here's what you do. I'm not saying we haven't been visited. I'm saying the evidence thus far brought forth does not satisfy the standards of evidence that any scientist would require for any other claim that you're gonna walk into the lab with. So here's what I recommend. Here's what I recommend. Next time you're abducted, because I'm ready for this. I'm ready, okay? I get abducted, I'm ready, okay? So you're there, you're like on the slab, because they always do like the sex experiments on you, on the flying saucer, so there you are, and they're poking at you. Here's what you do. 
You ready? You tell the alien, you're gonna be alien for this, right? So you're poking me, all right? So then I say- Finally, I'm on this side of the equation. Okay, so I say, hey, look over there. And then he looks over there, you quickly like snatch something off the shelf, put it in a pocket and then lay back. All right? <laughs> then, then you're done, you come back, you say, look what I got. Okay, I like stole the ashtray off the shelf of the flying saucer. And then you bring that to the lab. It's not about eyewitness testimony at that point, because you'll have something of alien manufacture. And anything you pull off of a flying saucer that crossed the galaxy is going to be interesting. Okay? Because even objects within our own culture. I got this a device here, okay? The iPhone. Ten years ago, they would have resurrected the witch-burning laws had you pulled this thing out, okay? <laughs> and that's in our own culture. Our own culture produced this over a ten-year span. So if, you, if there's some uh, technology that crossed the galaxy, that's going to be some serious stuff to look at in the lab. Then we can have the conversation. Until then, I can't, I'm sorry. Go ahead, keep trying to find them. I'm not going to stop you. But... Get ready for that time you are abducted because I'm gonna be looking for your evidence when that happens. So, here's what concerns me deeply, deeply. Everything that we are that distinguishes us from chimps emerges from that 1% difference in DNA. It has to, because that's the difference. The Hubble telescope, these grand, that's in that 1%. Maybe everything that we are that is not the chimp is not as smart compared to the chimp as we tell ourselves it is. Maybe the difference between constructing and launching a Hubble telescope and a chimp combining two finger motions as sign language, maybe that difference is not all that great. We tell ourselves it is, just the same way we label our books optical illusions. We tell ourselves it's a lot, maybe it's almost nothing. How would we decide that? Imagine another life form that's 1% different from us in the direction that we are different from the chimp. Think about that. We got 1% difference and we're building the Hubble telescope. Go, one, go another 1%. Who, what are we to they? We would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. That's what we would be. We would, they would take Stephen Hawking and roll them in front of their, their uh, primate researchers and say, well, this one is like the most brilliant among them because he can do sort of astrophysics in his head. Oh, isn't that cute? Little Johnny can do that too. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, in fact, Johnny just did that. Let me get it. It's, it's, it's on the refrigerator door. Here he is. He did it in his elementary school class. Think about how smart they would be. Quantum mechanics would be intuitive to their toddlers. Whole symphonies would be written by their children and, like I said, just put up on the refrigerator door the way our pasta collages are on our refrigerator doors. <laughs> so the notion that we're going to find some intelligent life and have a conversation with it? <laughs> when was the last time you stopped to have a conversation with a worm? <laughs> or bird. Oh, well, you might have had a conversation, but I don't think you expected an answer, all right? <laughs>